and welcome to this very special edition of the Jolly Heretic, still on tour and still in a studio. I have a very special guest for you today, and that is Mr. Tom Rousel, who from Survive the Jive. How do you do? How do you do, Ed? Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to meet you at last. Yeah, it's good to meet you in person. So uh, when you when you chat to someone online, and uh, weirdly with, with some people, you were about the height I imagined, Whereas Simon, who I had earlier, was shorter than than I imagined. I don't know how these things work, but um, some some of the people on the internet are good at making themselves look taller than they really are. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 completely true. And and so, first of all, um, obviously, I came across. Actually, I first came across your channel. You, I think you got in touch with me, didn't you? You were a guest on my channel. That's right. A couple of years ago, and I was a guest on your channel. I, I don't remember which was first. I, I was first. Okay. No, I was first, and I remember that you were doing it from. You were quite boomer tech. Uh, as was I, of course. But uh, there was there was nothing like this. It was it was it was bad internet in the countryside. Wasn't oh it? yeah, yeah. I, I, w when I moved from Sweden to England, I moved to rural England, and I had to use basically third world system of internet to make it work. There, there's no broadband. It was either uh, I had a, like a a four G aerial hanging out the window, or I tried to use like radio waves, which is used for rural Africa to broadcast internet. It's, How could the internet in rural England be so poor? Well. England, as you know, has some problem with competence crisis and all sorts of things. So uh, I think, uh, you know, actually, another part of the thing is the third world has, third world countries have some pretty impressive infrastructure in place. They have quite good roads, quite good hospitals and good, good internet in some third world countries, uh, better than we have. And I think, I don't know why exactly that is, but it's something to do with the way that they get aid and where we waste our money on Rubbish. Well, perhaps we'll go back to that in a minute when we talk about genetics. But what, uh, why do you think then that your your channel has become so popular? Um, well, I try very hard to make it popular. Um, I it, I've been at it for a long time. It's one of the oldest active channels on YouTube. Uh, oh, when did you start it? It started in April two thousand and six. Oh God, that's a Bloody hell, that's basically when YouTube started, isn't it? Uh, it's the same year. I think it started a few months earlier. Uh, but yeah, uh, it's definitely long before Google took over. And I, I didn't give it the name Survive the Jive until 2009. and made the Survive the Jive blog in 2007. And then I later decided to rename the channel Survive the Jive. It had previously been called Tom Rousel. <laughs> right, and and so, but what was it? What was it you think that allowed it to develop and, and take off? It started taking off in 2017 uh, initially when I started talking about paganism and the his history of paganism. But um, also at the same time, I around 2016, 2017, I got really into population genetics, um, and I started talking about that and just introducing people to the, some of the things that were being released in papers that I don't think the layman was fully aware of just how significant they were. And I don't, by layman, actually, I should not shouldn't just say layman as in people interested in history, but I mean, actually, also professional archaeologists and professional historians, I don't think they were aware of what, how groundbreaking some of the, the findings in archaeogenetics had been. Mm. Uh, and uh, I wanted to popularize that and make it a bit more well-known. But you've done some quite dramatic stuff as part of your videos. I mean, there was the Irish one where you took your top off and to, 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 to bear your tattooed, pagan <laughs> tattooed body. She's not doing that. No. Uh, uh, and and uh, what, what, what brings you to sort of the, the drama to it? You, you enjoy acting? Or... Uh, I, I, de I did. Uh, my, one of my A-levels was in theatre. I never took it further than that, though. But um, yeah, I, I, I understand. My, my, my first degree was not in history. It was in media and media strategy. And I, my, my career... Uh, has been in media and communication. So uh, in Sweden, I was working for the WHO as a, a media strategist for them. So I understand how to use media to change opinions and get attention and things like that. And obviously, uh, me taking off my shirt and shouting uh, was a way of getting attention. And uh, it's something that you as well have done in your videos. I, I, I have. My, my new people that are, that, are, that are behind the Jolly Heretic now have discouraged me from the, from there. They, they, they say that it's, uh, it's, it's good for the diehards, but that it's, uh, it's not necessarily entirely helpful with getting new people involved. New, new, because you seem funny and, and, and eccentric and they prefer a sort of serious, I, I guess they seem to be right. Uh, so I, I don't question it. But yeah, I, do, I do miss that. I do miss putting on costumes in much the same way that those, uh, those chimpanzees that used to do the PG tips out adverts apparently when when they retired them uh you know you remember those commercials from the yeah, yeah. It's pg tips it was typhoo i forget which one. i think, I think it's, it's pg tips. tips and when they retired them they get quite upset 
they, they, they used to enjoy dressing up and whatever, and, and I, I feel rather the same. Uh, True with thespian. Yeah, exactly. I, didn't, I, I did do A-level drama briefly, but then it was so chaotic. I, I dropped history, went to A-level drama for about two weeks. It was so utterly chaotic that I didn't just went back to history. Was it all women? Oh, no, it was boys' school. Oh, of course. Yeah. All boys' school. But it, it was, the sixth form was mixed. So, yeah, there were a lot of girls from the, the, the co-ed, the, the uh, other uh, the school that ours was attached to. So that's why you think it became. But tell me a bit more about so um, kind of where you came from, so if you don't mind. So where, I don't, actually, it's new to me. I don't actually know any of this. So where, where, whereabouts were you sort of brought up? Brought up in, uh, well, my, I went to primary school, the Catholic school uh, on the border of Surrey and Sussex. And then secondary school, uh, I was on the border of Oxfordshire and Berkshire. And Were your then, parents moving around a lot? Uh, my parents divorced just around that juncture, and so when I, I moved in with my father, uh, f- began secondary school, living with my That's father. That's quite unusual, isn't it, that the, 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 the child moves in with the father rather than it the is, mother? Well, it is. It, yeah, it was uh, a decision on my part. I wanted to live with my father. Uh, my uh, my mother, I have good relations with. Uh, I have good relations with both my parents, but... Yeah, at that stage, I'd wanted to live with uh, with with my. They were an only child. No, uh, far from it. Uh, my my father had three children with my mother, mm-hmm. and then he had three children with his second wife. Right. So, so did the three children, the, the two children, the two siblings, you have to they live with your father as well? When when when, when you the yeah. they all want to move. They were, and then he remarried and had more a, a, a further a further family. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so you went through and you did A levels. You did you did you the subjects you were interested in at school were uh, drama. Uh, well, media, English literature, uh, media and English literature. I, st- I just started doing media there, so and then I went on to. Hang, my... hang on, wait, 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 wait. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be patronising and rude, but I'm I'm talking to someone that did A level media studies. Yes. I'm afraid, I'm oh, sorry. oh, 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 but oh, oh, I wish I didn't know that. Well, I I, <laughs> I completely sympathise with your uh, with your position on media studies. Uh, I I, un- I understand that most of the people who uh, did it. Would not work. It was a yeah. joke, wasn't it? It was a laugh. Uh, not in my case because I n- had a very definite plan of action to work in media, and uh, well, I ended up. I was work, so. well. That's true. That is fair enough. But I was kind of warned off it. it. It was made clear to you that if you wanted to go to a good university, then you had to do three traditional A levels. It was mm. sneered at to do something. Even drama was a bit mm. dodgy, but, mm. to, but to do to do media studies was considered. Uh, not the not the done thing. No, well, I, I, it is a DOSA subject. There's no there's no escaping it. And even at I didn't my first degree wasn't at a particularly prestigious university. It was at the University of Brighton. And so you, uh, so you, did, so you did media studies, drama, and English lit. Is it, is uh, it? The, at at A level. So not even history. No, well, actually, I uh, I don't want to go too deep into it, but I could. I actually had to teach myself, so I didn't uh, stay at the sixth form. I got kicked out. I was working a job. Uh, at the time as well, I was being paid up to three thousand pounds a day, so I wasn't particularly um, incentivized to care about my college studies at that point. Are you were sixth form college, yes, and you were uh, so that kind of thing. Oh, I see. Okay, we- and then I, 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 they, I was working in Paris and Milan and London, so I was. What were you doing that? I was working in fashion. Uh, All right. So my, I, I quickly got a. Uh, I got. So how how at sixteen seventeen did you get into working in fashion? Assuming that's how old you were. Yes, I was seventeen years old, and um, I was scouted as a model when I was uh, attending. Uh, went to see a, a concert of a band called the Misfits, a punk band. And I like, and they just uh, ended up asked me to work in that. So it was quite a lot of easy money. A bit young for it, um, but uh, yeah, I had to complete my studies from self taught. Self taught. And I still got my A levels without any teachers or anything. Uh, so, so you were working all over the place on on catwalks and um, that sort of thing, yeah. And shoots for magazines and things. Yeah. Are there any particularly interesting magazines that we'd have heard of that you've that there are that there are semi naked pictures of Tom Ralph? <laughs> I was in Arena and ID magazine and Dolce Gabbana catalog and man, lots of things. Uh, it was I only it was a total of only a few months. In fact, it was less than a year. I didn't like I didn't have any interest in fashion or anything like that. Uh, it was just I wanted I, so basically easy money. I came out with you at a concert and said you look you're a handsome chap with a good body. Uh, queue there was a queue outside uh, for for a concert. Yes, I was queuing for a concert and someone said you can be. And then they mentioned some things. I said I don't know what those are. I don't know who you're talking about. They mentioned famous models. I said I don't listen to. I don't care about fashion. And they said yeah, but you can make millions. I said I care about that. So uh, I wanted some easy money. I got some easy money, but uh, um, then I went to Brighton, studied media. Why didn't you continue with just your, your career as a... As I, I said, I don't like, I don't have any interest in fashion. Ironically, I ended up working in fashion again after university. 
uh, I didn't mean that was also unintentional. My intention uh, was to work in visual media. And uh, once I graduated in 2007, it was an economic crash. It was very difficult. What to kind of school work. did you go to? State school? Uh, a mixture of schools. I went to I went five schools in five years. I moved around a lot. Uh, one of them, well, I did go to one uh, private school. Well, was your dad in the was. army or something? Or what? Um, no, no, he wasn't. Um, it was just uh, the circumstances of my life. Uh, the, the, uh, my parents divorced and mm. other things, moving around and that kind of thing. Mm, mm. So, um, so a variety of schools, and then you, and then you, you, you wanted to go to Brighton to study. Was any was that just because that's what you could get into, or was there some particular reason well, why? Limited, uh, because of the nature of my, my limited A levels, uh, the, as you previously mentioned, you can't you can't get into a prestigious university with just three A levels. So well, you can, but they have three A levels in proper uh, subjects. Yeah. Well, uh, I didn't have <laughs> that. So. Um, uh, yeah, uh, drama, media, and English literature uh, weren't uh, good enough to get me by. Uh, but I got into Brighton, and Brighton's good enough as far as I was concerned because I wasn't looking for uh, the prestige associated with the degree. I was looking for the skills that I needed to work in visual media. Mm, so, sort of polytechnic of the modern day. Yeah. yeah. And so you did your degree in media what was media studies what did they call it digital it was communications and media it was actually communications and media and so now now we're up to uh what i suppose the early 2000s 2007 i graduated yeah just before the economic crisis and then i ended up working in print media which uh, as a journalist instead so uh, that started with the um, i started off in vogue house and did work for vanity fair and gq with my first internships um and then I, from there, moved to East London to the more hipster area and did stuff for ID, again, who I'd worked for years before, uh, which is now owned by Vice Media. Uh, I was working a bit with Vice, but they never published anything by me. I worked for Dazed and Confused quite a bit. Uh, and um, and so, also so some, also Peters Geldof, I worked for her magazine and lots of little music magazines. And then from music, mag I, was, I was basically doing me music and fashion. And I never even said I liked fashion, but that was all that they would give me editorial work on was fashion. So I ended up back in fashion. Peters Geldof, is that the one that died? She was alive when I worked for her. But well, I imagine <laughs> so. Yeah. I would imagine she, it's, I, I can't imagine it would be particularly easy to work via Ouija board. Uh, to, for, for, That's she's, the sort of thing people were trying in the, in East London. At the she's, time. The one that, she's the one that died, though. She is the one that died, yeah. Right, that's right. It's Bob Geldof's daughter. That's right. I mm. once held Heavenly Hirana Lily, the other daughter. I was I was autograph hunting uh, outside a thing called TFI Friday. That they used to have, they filmed it in Hammersmith, the Riverside Studios, in the I, mid, mid I to late that. 90s. Yeah. Yeah. So there I was, I was about 15. And I went, I went along. We used to, me and my friend used to go along every week. He didn't have selfies in those days. He had autographs. And we get autographs of famous people. And one of them was Paula Yates. And she came out and she was holding Heavenly Hiran Lily. I said, can I have your autograph? And she said, yeah, yeah, sure. Hold my kid. <laughs> gave me Heavenly Hiran Lily. Signed my book. And, uh, and, uh, and, and gave, it, gave, gave, gave it back. Um, okay, so you, so you moved, into, you moved into, um, into these different kinds of media. But then I think I'm right in saying that you, you, you went back. Did you go back to university at some point? Yes, after... In, in, first, uh, after having worked freelance journalist, then I got a job with the biggest social media startup in Lon in Lon in England, uh, which was uh, also in Shoreditch. I was working for them for a few years, uh, managing sales team in San Francisco, and uh, also doing all their written like their blogs and stuff like that. And then I decided I got enough money that I could pay for a master's degree. Uh, so I went back to I wanted to go back to university and study history because in my spare time. For the years, I'd just been studying medieval history for fun. And then I thought, I'd quite like to have some kind of proof of my uh, of all the work I've been doing in studying medieval history. So I went, uh, I, I did an entry for UCL. They said, can you prove that you can do history? Uh, with an entry um, uh, essay, you know, right. this essay, it's an essay topic, and I did it, and they said, that's great. So you, you can study here. So I did the master's, and I focused on the study of... Uh, I uh, written sources of the Viking Age, uh, so Icelandic literature, but also Anglo-Saxon literature. What was it? You, well, that's isn't that pre-medieval? 
Um, well, no, it's not pre, pre medieval. Uh, it, it's all early medieval, mostly. Before. I thought they date medieval to 1066, and that the borderline. They, they, they. No, I mean medieval. In fact, they don't really like the term medieval in in academia anymore. But yeah, I mean the the written sources for the Viking Age are mostly from the 12th, 13th century. Oh, I anyway, yes, but yeah, yes, uh, not that, a bit, well, yeah, a bit. So what was it? What was it? Going back a bit, because that that's interesting. That the the romanticization we used to have of that age in Victorian England, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Tennyson's poetry, all this. It's, something about it well what was it in particular about the medieval era of england i assume england that, that, that uh, fascinated you so much um i around 2009 and my in my independent study i became very interested in the methods involved in changing people and in changing and converting and uh because we're seeing such radical shifts in ideology and in you know ma- like in media we deal with like uh the changing people's minds on mass huge you know mass communications and i was just thinking i what will the, the you know one of the really interesting things for europe is the conversion to christianity and mm-hmm. i really wanted to know about that the, the the methods used that were facilitated this huge ideological shift uh in the history of europe and that was just to sort of that was the focus of pretty much all that's, of my that's fascinating mm-hmm. what, what, what i mean I, I don't know if you know but what my first book was about, my these are basically conversion experiences and, mm. and and methods of conversion. I was what what kind of things, what kind of methods were used to convert people? Um, all kinds. It varies across the continent, of course, in different times. But I mean, sometimes you have an elite model where you, you only focus on changing the elites, which sometimes could be incentivized just for financial matters. Like I think a lot of northern kingdoms were looking at the greater wealth and prosperity in the south of Europe and wanted to be a part of it. So. Obviously, they say you can you can join us if you accept if you get baptized. And once the king converts, some of the nobles will convert too, and then gradually you have a, a cultural sort of trickle down effect where everyone beco- joins in. Um, other times, there's more brutal methods. Uh, for example, in the Orkneys, um, all of Trygvason uh, kidnapped the children of uh, pagan chiefs and said, "I'll kill him if you don't come baptize." So. That's a, but there was a period, wasn't there? I, I don't know. If it was at the Orkneys. I I read about this, or where exactly it was. But there was a period where they're kind of both. They're hedging their bets. You you actually have gravestones that have both pagan and uh, Christian uh, inscriptions or images or whatever. They're, they're they're both. That's I mean that's a strange thing. It's almost we have almost this at the moment. I think that you with the Church of England. On the one hand, it's Church of England, there's Jesus, whatever. But on the other hand, there's the rainbow flag, and there's the, there's the new religion. There's right. the new, let's say, the new religion. Yes, and they're side by side. That's really interesting. I think that that's a good comparison because what we're seeing here, in we look at what's happening now with the shift from Christianity to the new religion, whatever you want to call it. But I, I, it certainly is a religion, and it's replaced in Christianity. Uh, it's done in a way, a very gradual way, where the traditional sort of uh, religious iconography and the passion, the, the the passionate outlets for mass emotion are preserved in this new religion. We have, you know, victims who are, you know, the um, the they 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 suffer for us all and this kind of thing. And uh, there's a lot of similarity between it, and that transition is quite gradual, and it even allows for dual faith of, of the sort you described. And I think something like that would have happened. Uh, with the conversion of Christianity too, there are, there are. It's not always so cynical as a, a person literally thinking, "I'm going to hedge my bets." It could be one or the other. Mm. Uh, it, it can happen much more naturally, as I think it is happening with the. If you, I'm if you're sure you've got liberal friends who are also Christians, they don't really. Have, I don't think they actually really entertain the fact that the two beliefs they hold are contradictory. They don't really sit down. I think, think they don't, that. they don't see, yeah, I do, I do know many, many people like that and they don't see woke as a religion. That's the thing at all. Mm. They see, yeah, Christianity is my religion. I'm a Christian and I'm, I'm also in fa- pa- passionately in favor of social justice because that's what Jesus wanted. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and they don't see it as a religion, but then gradually it takes over more and more and more um, until you get to a point where there's so many churches now that have rainbow flags or Ukraine flags, which in some ways are kind of the same thing. Um, and, and ironically, really, but 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 you do, and and, and until the, the the tentacles of one are so firmly into the other that the change has kind of happened without almost like you knowing it. Yeah. Um. And and, and suddenly they're just both things, and uh, Jesus is displaced. 
I think initially the, the, the Christianity that the Anglo-Saxons were converting to would not be recognizable as Christianity to many modern Christians because, for example, they're referring to him as a young Harleth, that means a young warrior. Uh, and uh, they, they sometimes depict him as a knight, like a soldier, or the, the apostles are referred to as thanes. The thanes in Anglo-Saxon society are the elite, like military guard of the, of the, of the warrior leader. Uh, obviously, that's completely nothing to do with what Christ was not an Anglo-Saxon warrior with um, with thanes around him. The apostles are something altogether different. But the 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 recognizable uh, symbols and cultural traits associated with power within the pagan world mm. were preserved in a new version of Christianity. And Pope Gregory even said to do this, like also he said, don't destroy their temples, just take out the idols and put one of Jesus in. So like the transition was much more gradual than, than on the ground. They wouldn't necessarily felt that it was so big, a huge change culturally as it really was. And in fact, there is a, it beat even records um, the king in East Anglia, Radwald, who kept in the temp in his own temple, he kept his idols of the gods, Thunor and Woden, and he added uh, a, a idol of Christ next to them. So while the Christian faith theologically requires the non worship not worshipping any other gods the pagan faith doesn't have any kind of uh, rule against adding an idol of christ to your altar so no, so no. it was quite easy to sort of slip him in and then once people had gotten used to the idea of him as being one of the gods then you could get rid of the other ones yeah i don't know if you've read alan de benoit's book on being, being a pagan. pagan. Yeah, a long time ago. Right? Um, I irritatingly can't get him to come on my channel because he insists on speaking in French and I don't speak French well enough. But yeah, he'll, apparently he does speak good English, but anyway, anyway he, he, he's typical French. got to be in French. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, uh, but he makes this distinction and he draws a number of, on a number of levels between what is it, what is the, what is the, the poly, the monotheist and what is the polytheist? And it's these fundamental differences between is the world a good place or a bad place? Is history cyclical or linear? Um, is there one god or many gods? Are there multiple interpretations of history or just one? And it's this level of 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 almost bigotry on on the part of monotheism. But no, it's it's our way. It's our way. It's right. Yes. Whereas in even when I've been in India, and which is I guess one of the last functioning pagan cultures, really, and you have some people that oh yeah, my god is Jesus. Mm -hmm. I'm a Hindu, mm -hmm. um, and that's not considered uh, that's not considered a problem at all. No. And he presumably would have had that. Um, at this at this kind of stage of the, of the development of Christianity, I mean, quite late though, because Alfred the Great is known to be one of our most pious kings. Mm -hmm. But as I understand it, from, albeit from a popular history book I read called something like the Year Ten Hundred or something like that, uh, it was published in the year nineteen ninety nine, about the year ten hundred, mm -hmm. and they they noted that they, they talked about Alfred being descended from Woden. That's right, and it was very important that that was known and believed. Yeah, but yet. Pious Christian society. Yes, well, the tradition of claiming descent from Woden. I did one of my essays at uni on this, and I've done some, talked about it in some of my videos. Woden, for those who aren't aware, is the king of the English gods. He's a, very much equivalent to Odin in Norse mythology, and he was. It was necessary for the pagan Anglo-Saxon kings to trace their descent to him. Not all of them. Some some of the royal houses trace descent to other gods, but most of them to uh, Woden. And uh, this tradition was preserved after Christianity. However, it had to be neutralized. And so they simply said that Woden was, uh, they also added an extra genealogy connecting Woden to Noah. So that Woden was one of the, you know, one of the people on the, on, uh, on the ark or something like that. Yes. So that he, he was integrated into the Christian Jewish mythology. But uh, they, they didn't want to do away with this very time on a tradition, which distinguished the upper class from the lower class. I seem to recall there was also an idea that the Norse gods were descended from the Trojans. This is something that come, is, isn't a pagan tradition. This is something completely unrelated. It's, uh, they go back ultimately to Zeus. Yeah, well, this um, claiming descent from Trojans, uh, the first person to do that is a French author uh, in the Migration era, and he claimed that the origin of the, Fran the French was in Troy. And later, as the medieval era catches on, like, Monk, Christian monks all over Europe start saying, claiming that they're descended from Trojans because uh, once we shift to a literate culture, we prioritize and, and value the, the, his, the cultures that are attested in uh, literature. And that meant basically um, people who are in the Bible or people who are in the classical tradition, like the Trojans and the Greeks. And as far as uh, uh, one, 
this privileging of, of literary sources, which we still have now, resulted in people almost not believing the other peoples in the world had existed. Because if they're not in the Bible, they're not in, mentioned by the Greeks and they probably didn't exist as far as they're concerned. But now we know from DNA, we're unearthing the real story of the Bronze Age Europe, which doesn't, uh, of course, match at all these. I mean, for hundreds of years, I think a significant amount of people in Britain believed that the British descended from Brutus and the, the Trojans who came here with him, which is, of course, made up by a Welsh monk at some point. But yeah, it's not unique to Britain. Like the Icelanders had a made up something about them all being descended from kings of Troy and Scythia, and the French started it. It's just a fashion which prioritizes literate cultures in the East over the indigenous cultures of Europe. Well, you mentioned, before we move on to that DNA issue, which I think is very interesting, um, why, why is it then that some of the uh, Anglo-Saxon kingdoms were wanted descent from gods other than Woden? Well, um, because they were polytheists and Woden wasn't the only god of, of significance to them. Um, uh, I mean, the earliest sources on we have on Germanic people is Tacitus, the Roman historian, and he says that they different Germanic peoples descend from three different progenitors, which are probably gods. Uh, and uh, it, it, he divides them up into the categories. He actually divides them ethnically into the descendants of the different of these three different gods, Istio, Ermin, and uh, Ing. Uh, well, Ing is quite easily identified in English paganism as Ing the Frey, mm. who is uh, called in Norse paganism Freyr. Uh, he's, he's king. He's also mentioned in later medieval sources as being a king in Uppsala. Euhemerism uh, as a technique in Christian, uh, by Christians used it, they to say, okay, yeah, those gods, those were just people, right? You were worshipping, you're just worshipping a big king of old times. Well, so, Euhemerus said that Zeus was a person, didn't he? That's yeah, that's why he started, Euhemerus was from pagan times, but it's, it's, Euhemerism is not originally a Christian technique, but it's mostly associated with Christian authors because it became a way to discredit paganism later on. And also to preserve their national myths without, because like, you know, people still had like nationalistic pride, but they didn't want to associate with, you know, they didn't want to, you know, say that the, 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 basically in uh, Christian theology requires that the gods that, of your ancestors were either demons or people, because they can't be gods because there's only one God according to their belief. So it's much more flattering to say that your ancestors worshipped a great king than to say that they worshipped a demon. So they would try and say, that um, actually it was just a great king that fooled everybody into thinking he was a god. Speaking of demons um, uh, and evil people, let's move back to British universities um, and wokeness. No, so you, you, so you went to uh, University College London yes. to, and you did a master's degree in history, well, or a bachelor's degree, master, master's degree, master's degree in, in medieval history. Uh, and what was your what was your master's thesis? What was your focus? Uh, it was on horse sacrifices uh, in Northern Europe. So I was wanting to show that demonstrate the connections and the similarities between those in Scandinavia and those in England but um I wanted actually what I didn't do what I want was too controversial in 2011 to do was was to show that those same techniques of war sacrifice existed in Asia among like the Aryans whatever but at that time in 2011 Indo-European studies was still a little bit beyond the pale it was still not considered like the smart and normal thing for a student to, to pursue. Uh, but that has changed significantly since 2015 because of the genetic findings that happened, came out from, since then. Um, and so what, there was, a, there was a pressure from your supervisor or something to not look at this or? Uh, well, he definitely advised against it. I mean, my personal tutor, uh, who I respect very much, he, he in his personal, in his own writing on, um, on, he wrote a book called Heathen Gods in Old English Literature, but he immediately begins by dismissing uh, the comparative mythologists who use Indo-European studies. He's saying, I don't find that useful at all. So he didn't have very much respect for that whole field. Uh, so uh, he obviously sort of steered me away from it as well. But I think um, not entirely unreasonably because at the time, I mean, it was still considered. Indo-European is something that you would only really utter in linguistic studies. No, outside of linguistics, talking about the Indo-Europeans uh, in 2011 was a little bit like a little bit too much like um nazi mysticism or something like that and that was considered yes i can see how that might be considered uh, nazi it's sort of savitri devi um it, it, might, it might be considered not something to pursue in 2011 and so then after you finished your your master's degree and you got the before we go on to the i want to i want to look at the actual topic itself what, what did you do then 
Um, well, my the next thing I pursued was I was I was going to try and do a PhD in Uppsala, and that's what originally led me there. Are there? Um, well, the the head of the archaeology department, Neil Price, uh, there was they had a position available with funding um, for a pay position, and I wanted to do more work showing the connections between the um, migration, well, the Vendel era culture of around Uppsala with that of Anglo Saxon. So, the Vendel era for our uh, okay, the, the Vendel era is the era directly preceding the Viking era in Scandinavia. So between the, the sandwich between the migration era and the Viking era. And uh, these wonderful helmets you see, where often people call them Viking helmets, they're actually pre, a lot of them are pre-Viking. There's only one so Viking. What year is pre What's the border between Viking and pre-Viking? Uh, well, the Scandinavians have a different uh, definition of Viking Age than we do. So, I mean, we, we define the Viking Age when the Vikings first arrive at Lindisfarne, 798. I think that, I can't remember when the Scandinavians do. But yeah, basically you're talking like 600, 700 is Vendel era in, in Scandinavia. Ah. Um, and... So it's contemporary with like East Anglia and like Sutton Hoo in England. The Sutton Hoo helmet is, you see in the British Museum is very similar to the helmets around Uppsala from that time. Very similar. And that has been observed since, since the 1960s. I just wanted to look at that in more detail and compare the different burial st- yep. styles and things. Uh, anyway, uh, long story short, I didn't get that position, but I was headhunted by the WHO for a media position there. So I worked there instead doing that. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, there is something fascinating about the Anglo-Saxon. I remember when I was about eleven. That was that was or eleven, ten, ten to eleven. That that was I was always into a period of history at any given time, and my Lego would reflect it. So I would. You, I don't know if you know this. You can make Anglo-Saxon Lego. By, I mean, you're a bit younger than me, about five or six years younger than me. But you have Lego. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you combine pirate Lego, which has the beards and stuff, with normal medieval Lego, and you can make like Anglo-Saxon Lego. Uh, oh, that was uh, yeah, that's what I yeah, it was very innovative of me. And I, 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 and I went, I got my parents to take me. It was about October '91. Oh, it was in that half term to a. Um, we went to first to York and the Yorvik Centre and all this, you know, oh, a Viking that is, but you know, that kind of period, um, and then up to Lindisfarne, uh, and uh, which you could cross in the. You can cross. You can drive over as long yeah. as it's the right time. Have you been there? Yeah, I, I went there in 2010. Yeah, as long, I went there in 1991. And as long as you can drive, you can drive over. You go over there, and it's fascinating. You know, this ruined monastery, and there's a few houses, a few people live there, and you, you can look as a gift shop. Well, this is 91. I don't know what it is now. Um, and it was absolutely something about it. That period before the mega change, that period where England was still. The English, you haven't got these Normans coming in who are something else, mm. who are, who are well, not French, they're ultimately Viking, but the, they're Viking and they speak French. Mm. And that was that, the last period of the true England. Mm. And the Americans developed that. They argued that they were a, a yeoman republic of the, Ang- of the, the true Anglo-Saxons. Mm. What do you think about that? Is, that? is that the real England, the Anglo-Saxons? I think that, that idea, that romantic... Uh narrative is is popularized with the diggers and people like that in the 1600s and uh obviously it feeds very well into protestant the rise of protestantism and the the demands of new uh social classes in england to have a certain respect and rights and things like that and uh of and that gets also tied in with like the extremist uh things that happened in the late 18th century that lead to the French and American revolutions. Um, so naturally, it it, 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 it it comes from that. I, I have, I do think that um, there has been a constant consciousness of Anglo-Saxon history for since 1066, but the, it's the idea of the Norman yoke and things like that is, well, certainly not borne out by um, genetics, and I've had arguments with this both with people who believed themselves to be pure-blooded Normans. Uh, someone we were talking about earlier, we both know who, who who thinks that of himself, and also on the other side, people who believe themselves to be pure, hearty Saxons with none of that fl- Frenchified nonsense in it. Both of them are incorrect because, uh, like the, the the amount of time that's passed since then means everyone's quite jumbled up. Uh, there isn't anyone with. Uh, Pure, you know, we all have descent from Normans. We all have descent from Anglo-Saxons and the and the. Well, Brits. I think I get the impression that the the migration was such that fairly immediately, uh, it was Norman men that came over, and there's the natural process that we all know about uh, that that uh, the women marry up, women marry status, women 
uh, collaborate horizontal. Mm -hmm. uh, they they collaborate with the the dominant invader, and that's the norm. And I know in my right. in my own family tree, mm -hmm. um, Odard, first Lord of the Manor of Dutton, who I don't know if he was at Hastings, but he was in the Doomsday Book, um, and his wife was Alice, daughter of Reven, and probably was a Saxon. He would have fought if they gave him lands. He must have had a reason to be given them. So. He probably did fight. But yeah, I mean, also it's an incentive for the Normans to marry the leftover noble Anglo-Saxon women because it gives the appearance of legitimacy for the takeover of their properties and things. So uh, a lot. So of then the those children are Normo-Saxons. Yeah, it was. I mean, the, the process of integration was very quick. And uh, anyway, the, the genetics. But we don't have. There's not any proper genetic study on Norman cemeteries yet, so we can really talk I, about that's Norman genetics. I found really strange. We, we should. I, I don't. I believe I'm right in saying that we we don't have the. Um, the, the the DNA evidence is not sufficiently nuanced that we're able to talk about ha having Norman ancestors. Uh, not in the genetic. I mean, we can trace. Many of us, yourself and I included, can trace our genealogies back to Normans. But, yeah, but, but you, why, why is genetic part of the Y chromosome Norman? Well, that's a problem because there's nothing uniquely uh, about. I mean, my Y chromosome, for example, is unusual in the sense that it's associated with Scandinavians. But that doesn't mean. And my name sounds Rus Rousel, probably Roussel. But that doesn't mean, I mean, you would assume that Normans brought in a Scandinavian thing, but then it could just as well be Anglo-Saxon or Viking because they all carried that as well. So it, the Normans not, were previously Viking. Yeah. Yes. So. The Anglo-Saxons and the Vikings also came from, so it's not easy to distinguish them. There's nothing uniquely Norman about them. And there was, friend, um, what makes it even more confusing is that now from a recent big study, uh, 2022, we realized that the French, a significant amount of French DNA had already started arriving with the Anglo-Saxons because... Some of the Anglo-Saxons were Franks. The Franks, like, okay, culturally, the, these Franks were coming in, they were Germanic pagans, they were speaking Germanic languages, Frankish, not French. But genetically, they were Gauls who had adopted Germanic culture. I thought the Gauls were Celtic. Well, they were, but not some of them adopted, because there's no hard border between France and Germany. So like, a lot of like people, Germanic culture sometimes shifts over. And so basically, some of the Germanic people coming into England what was to become England during the migration era were genetically speaking French. Some of them were German and some were Danish or Swedish genetically, but they were all, they wouldn't have seen themselves. They would have seen, they come, they're all Germanic in their yeah, culture. I know that when I did it, because I found, I found that uh, there was somebody called, uh, Chee, what was the surname? Warburton. That was the surname. Um, and they used to be Dutton and they became Lords of Warburton and they took the name Warburton. And I found that I have the same the Y chromosome as this Warburton people. So that shows it's the same, it's the same group, you know, this Odard yeah. person. But then that chromosome is the same as it was some sort of French royal um, who, or, who, who traces back to some Germanic king, Witten, something of Witten. Um, so that's Germanic. Yeah. So the, 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 common, the Y chromosome of this Norman, Odard, is obviously ultimately Germanic. So yeah, yeah. yeah there's... there's... It's, it, it's, it gets very difficult to dis distinguish, but... Uh, during that time of massive upheavals and things. But we can see for sure that the Anglo-Saxon invasion had a massive change because the Anglo-Saxons are sufficiently dis distinct from the Iron Age Britons that we can tell when they invaded and what and how that and how they changed approximately 75% replacement of the eastern side of the country and then the east and the western sides gradually mixed together. The and is this, this replacement is what, just killing? Well, I'd say how could you replace 75% of the eastern part of England without killing Mass killing. It's. Po I'm going to say I don't. I, there's possible a, a lot of refugees fleeing west to get away from it who weren't killed, uh, but I mean, yeah, there's going to have to be some killing. Mm. And uh, the argument against that is that where are the graves? Where are the graves? But I think that arguing from the absence of evidence is not a strong position, especially when there's just the genetic evidence that there was this. Well, also I suppose there was this idea, wasn't there, with regard to the Anglo-Saxon replacement? Um, there was this idea that the the east of the country is increasingly Anglo-Saxon or uh, or mixing Anglo-Saxon and, and the Celts that are there, I don't know, presumably marrying their women. Um, and the west of the country was was kept more with the Roman Empire, kept more aligned with the dying Roman Empire, had more trade with them. And then you have the Great Justinian Plague, and that's presumably going to affect Western Britain mm. much more than Eastern Britain, Eastern Britain, which is Saxon. Yeah. And so that would have killed a lot of them off. Well, the Justinian plague probably did play a role in helping to clear the way for the Saxons. Uh, but I think what happened is it, after that initial violent thing in the in the eastern side of the country, 
there was a gradual blending mm. so that today everyone even the cornish are minimum 25 percent anglo-saxon and the and other people are nearly half anglo-saxon so everyone in england is between a quarter and half anglo-saxon uh now uh, but there's there's a difference between east and west though isn't there yeah, generally speaking, it's it's lower in the West than in the East. Because that would, in terms of things like the things I've researched, you know, group selection and so forth, that would make quite good sense of the Civil War. Right. Because yeah. because what you've basically got is the East of the country, mm. which is just Saxon mm. and Protestant. Mm. And then the West of the country is a Saxo-Celtic Klein. Mm. And they're, ones, they're Catholic mm. also. They're, they're not Protestant as well, but they're less, they're, yeah. they're, they were on the side of the king. Yeah. Um, and then you have that war. And it's the Saxons. Yeah, it's it's like the 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 Celtic fringe of the nation, like the Scots as well as and the and the Welsh have traditionally sided with the English aristocracy against the emergent middle classes yeah. of England, who are the Saxon stock. But some of this gets mixed up in one of the what what the Wellcome Trust study from Oxford, uh, headed by Walter Bodmer, found was that um, a huge jumbling up of English DNA happens during the Industrial Revolution. Such that, like, some of the, while like Cornwall and Devon are still their old, like, unique genetic groups, and parts of like the Cumbria is still uniquely its own group, mm. parts of Yorkshire, Scotland is uniquely, but yeah, the rest uh, of England is all just one jumbled. You all get, jumbled you get up. don't you, with people that are from sort of Dorset mm -hmm. and your old Devon, the, the people with black hair. Yes, this is a known. I don't know how that happened there, but this is a, this is a known. Yeah, I noticed that you get some people in Cumbria and parts of the southwest that are darker and smaller, and so that might be an old. Certainly, thing. Cornwall darker. Yeah, well, I think that's probably an old Brythonic phenotype that was from before Roman times. I was so. talking a while ago to a, a girl, a bit younger than me, lives in Olu. Uh, she's Cornish. A proper Cornish, because of course about half people there now people have moved in. They're all London and so uh, uh, Exactly. Uh, but as she would say, you can tell just from looking at somebody whether they're sort of proper Cornish, mm. like her, dark, mm. um, or whether or whether they're uh, the the newbies from from London. And there's a definite difference. That really, they do Cornish have, people are dark. They do. There are well, some of them are. Yeah, there are. They're not exclusively dark, but that is there is a a certain phenotype that is unique to them. That wasn't there like the, but the the more highly Saxon areas are not. Uh, are not like these ancient and not don't exist in these clearly defined genetic uh, medieval genetic areas anymore because of the industrial revolution so everyone from the midlands and the southeast and the center of england are pretty jumbled up and and quite closely related hmm. uh because but this wasn't the case in in the 1640s no it wasn't yet the case so so in a, in a, in a period of extreme cold which it was I and mean, then, then you can and you can see it's enough if one group then yeah the protestantism will have that the other group is more is, was less was more catholic mm. uh you can see that's and in the american civil war mm. is it's just a repeat of it yeah i think england the, the settlement of america is interesting because you get a lot of people from the southwest uh like and people of and aristocratic people moving to the south so that's similar to the the, the civil war allegiance of, of like a more celtic blooded uh what uh peasants uh, allied with English aristocrats uh, and then in the north you get like the, the Puritans are mostly from the Germanic uh, middle class English so sort of. all the way back we're going to here we're going all the way back to Anglo-Saxon England we're seeing really the roots of wokeness uh, and not just the roots of wokeness but the roots of extreme Puritanism uh the roots of the op which well was the wokeness of its time but it was of course advocating exactly the opposite thing mm -hmm. uh you know the extremity that the extremity that we get to by the 50s you know god let's girls got pregnant by a she's unmarried it's perking up for adoption you know, it gets that extreme the middle class attitudes and these are basically well it's oversimplification i suppose but it's it's saxon there's some relationship between it I, I hesitate to say like there's a direct cause of wokeness coming from anglo-saxon dna I, well i, I don't just, just hesitate. Get, i don't do think these saxons <laughs> i i mean there was an interesting study about um i'm sure you're aware of it i, I don't know to what extent is a reliable sample size or anything like that. But I remember a study which looked at the baby's rea reactions to being get put into the care of someone from a very notably, visibly different race. And the, and the, and the, the, the babies that were most accepting and least distressed by being put into the care of a foreign looking person were from Saxony. Huh. So it, it is, that's quite an interesting phenomenon, isn't it? The, the, oh, goodness me, really? And 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 they were the least distressed. Least distressed by being put into the care of someone. Who were the most distressed? 
uh, I think, uh, I can't remember, but it was non-European children. They don't like it at all being put in the care of someone who looks different to them. Uh, so no, that's a, that's a, that's a fascinating difference. Um, moving back though to European, I suppose. So one of the things you were talking about earlier was uh, these radical findings. So you you, you didn't you didn't want to look into the Indo-European issue. Um, it's become more acceptable now, and it's become more acceptable due to radical findings which you didn't expect were unexpected and whatever. And it's these that you've you've talked about on your channel, and this is what you think is is popular. So for those that are oh, those made it more popular. So for those that are unfamiliar with them, could you tell us what some of these some of the most interesting and radical findings are? Why they're so significant? Sure. Well, like ancient DNA is. Uh, study is almost as old as like the study of DNA. Uh, in the 90s, it was limited to they couldn't get like much DNA from from uh, ancient skeletons, and uh, they would when they did, it was they were only able to look at mitochondrial haplogroups, sometimes at Y haplogroups. But what now that since 2015, they've been able to get a DNA like autosomal DNA, which is the sort of thing that you you get that you're getting your results for when you get a 23andMe test. It's like this, it tells you all about your whole genetic makeup and they can say all kinds of things they weren't previously able to because now they can get decent samples by using some specifically getting dna for um taking sampling from the petrous bone which is a small bone near the ear uh that one apparently they've learned is very dense and as a result preserves dna for much longer and uh once they started focusing on that and also they've developed techniques to reduce the risk of contamination which is always a problem with uh, ancient dna study they started to get all kinds of interesting results and also they made the process much cheaper so whereas universities would have to save thousands and thousands and thousands to get a, a sample now they now it costs less than a hundred dollars per sample so okay now that opens up the all kinds of possibilities for study that were closed to many universities previously uh and one of the big papers the first big papers that really like kicked the doors in on the old regime was called um Massive migration from the steppe is a source for Indo-European languages in Europe. I love that you've learned that it's so important that you've learned it off by heart. It was, I think I think I got it right, and it was by Hark and colleagues, and it was the one that basically identified the gen the genetic signal associated with the spread of Indo-European languages in the end of the Neolithic, and it was already identified so ten thousand years ago. Um, not not that not quite more like uh, five or six five or six thousand years ago. Right. Um, in Ukraine, South Russia and Ukraine, uh, it were the, from a, an archaeological culture they call the Yamnaya, and uh, which is Russian for pit grave. It just describes the, the style of graves that they had, and then previously been speculated to be the Indo-Europeans by several archaeologists and historians, like uh, David Anthony is a famous one, and before him uh, Maria Gumbutas uh, and others. In fact, I think there was an Englishman who even suggested that the Russian steppe and was probably the source of Indo-European languages way back in the 19th century. Um, I can't remember his name, I'm afraid. But anyway, the DNA made it clear that this is a really important thing. And it also made it clear that the spread of farming, the Neolithization, Neolithic, the arrival of the Neolithic in Europe was not the arrival of Indo-European languages because they also realized that there was a before the Indo-European invasions, another big invasion of people from Anatolia who replaced many of the undergatherers and brought farming. And these are the people who built Stonehenge, etc. And these stone circles we find it everywhere in Western Europe. But that these people, and that these Stonehenge, that's, is, this is pre-farming. No, Stonehenge is farming. It's, it's the farm. Farming. The first farmers are the people who are making these stone circles. Okay. So they they came in from Anatolia, beginning eight thousand years ago, spread across Europe, um, and they brought. Uh, farming of uh, the first grains and cattle and sheep and uh, uh, they were very crude farmers but they were the f they were coming in and it had previously been thought that these must have been the Indo-Europeans. Can I digress on something? Because Please. Because this, this, this is it, it's an interesting point. So you, you've got, I can completely see how you've got people, Stonehenge, um, massive building project. So you have to have uh, an excess of labour uh, in order to have an excess of labour, you have to have farming. Farming allows you to create crafts and whatever, and you have people that don't have to spend all their time uh, gathering food and so forth. And so you can see how they can do these big building works. But as we understand it, I don't know if you have a view on this, Gebekli Tepe, mm -hmm. whatever you pronounce it, Gebekli Tepe, is pre-farming. Um, and it's massive. And some of the stuff is quite complicated. Only the other day in the paper, they revealed some new complicated statue of a man with a big penis or something, a, a, a Gebekli Tepe. Um, how on earth would they manage to do these things pre-farming? Yeah. What do we... Well, um, there's, there's some 
question about that because um okay the neolithic and pre-neolithic uh, anatolia is not my forte but um the gebekli tepe is presumably made because it predates what we now call farming it's you say that but also like some hunter gatherers were probably using not domesticated grains but like semi domesticated grains and they were harvesting uh grass seeds before they were domesticated the process of domestication is quite gradual probably mm -hmm. where people start initially harvesting the grass seeds but as you choose the better ones and you're dropping i don't know like maybe you're planting some of them that eventually they get to like domestic grains uh in other parts of the world i can speak quite confidently about how hunter gatherer society can reach that level of sophistication in Gebekli Tepe, I'm not really certain how, but for example, I can give is in the the, the Jomon people of Japan, uh, and also similarly in the Pacific Northwest of America, the Native Americans there. Both of them were essentially hunter-gatherer cultures that reached a very high level of sophistication, and they were able to have organized, they were settled communities with organized hierarchies which could command all the labor because of the wealth of the sea, because they had a way of, you know, harvesting huge amounts of protein from the sea that could sustain large populations. Gebekli Tepe, that isn't the case, so I don't really understand, but there must have been something. You couldn't possibly have just had everyone hunting and gathering because they would have instantly depleted all the resources of the area and it wouldn't have been possible to continue. I suppose you could say, at, at what point do you an agricultural society? You an agricultural society if 40% of your food is from farming? No. Are you if 70% is? I suppose so. So there's probably that element to it there's as well. There's nuance, yeah. But there's nuance to mm -hmm. it. But yeah, you are, I wonder what was... They, they must have been getting it from some from somewhere because then we the we the bones that they have found at Quebec Tepe are not from domesticated uh, animals no none of them so it, they haven't domesticated animals that's no it's it's quite a, it's quite a mysterious site it's not something that I've done a lot of study and I'm not the right person no I, I don't well it. perhaps I just I just thought you might have a view on it but yeah. and I because it's something I'm looking at myself mm -hmm. uh, so yes so you you the, you have this uh, Indo-European movement then from the steps from uh, be beginning in somewhere around Ukraine, uh, one modern day Ukraine, mm -hmm. uh, and moving in, you have the, the the Turkish farmers first, the Anatolian farmers first wave, yeah. and they are agricultural agriculturists. They're almost the the first farmers in Europe are preserved today in a population. The Highlanders of Sardinia are basically pure blooded Neolithic Europeans. So you can imagine that Europe was populated almost entirely by them. They're basically the Anatolians who moved into Europe and mixed with the European hunter-gatherers to make the race that's called by geneticists EEF or early European farmers. And then modern Europeans are all a mixture of early European farmers and Indo-Europeans. And that just varies mostly uh, on a north-south gradient with more... And early hunter-gatherers. Yeah, but the, both the Indo-Europeans and the Neolithic farmers have European hunter-gatherer ancestry. So I'm just saying mm. you can have it as a four-way model or a two-way model, really. Uh, some people like the three-way model, but I don't think that makes sense as much because although it is true there were a refuser of Western hunter-gatherers in the Neolithic, so maybe it does make sense to make it a three-way model because the three races did coexist in Europe at a time. But since that admixture is already present in the farmers, it's easier just to say it's a two-way model or a four-way model to go further back, but yeah. Um, okay, so this was this was one of the the major findings. What, what, what are other major findings that we got? Uh, well, uh, also the source of one that caused great controversy is the um, uh, the arrival of Indo-European languages in India. That was more in 2018 that that started to kick off, and I uh, got a video about the Aryan invasion uh, about uh, to talk about that. Uh, basically, it shows that the similar race of people went east from northeast northeastern Europe into. India and Iran to bring into European language there. Another is the Anglo-Saxon invasion of England that's now been proven because a lot of people try to make out that it was just a gentle, you know, friendly exchange of cultures and with a language, English language just being adopted voluntarily by the uh, post-Roman Britons. No. Yes, this particular TV historian, rather rotund fellow, I can't remember his name. Francis Pryor? Yes. Who goes on and on about that. Yes, and, and and I remember watching the documentaries about it, and uh, and he was with such dogmatic fervor that he was correct that I, I just thought, no. yes, that really grated on me as well because I just thought he obviously wants to be Celtic, and um, he's far as he said, we are a Celtic people. Yeah, that was his, and everything his good is from Celtic, and there was nothing bad about the Celts, and we're Celts, and that's it, we're Celtic, and I just thought, well, how, uh, we're not. 
Uh, um, if we were, then why is it that the Jedix of the Cornish and the Welsh is so different from us? And why and why do all the place names get changed and the language get changed? I just don't think that that's how languages change. A lot of those place names are redolent of someone who has worked out a common language with somebody else, saying, what's that called? And then saying it, mm. and then going, right, and making it into their own language. Yeah. So what, you can see that with the place. Well, could we know the same process happened in a place like Australia in more recent history. So we know, like, you know... We call, we ask them what's that in their language, they say river, and then we just say, okay, so it's X river. So the actual translation of the name becomes river, river, because it gets the same. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or yeah. With the, 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 the days of the week are an interesting example. Mm. If we if it, we were all Celts, why is it that the day that, it's interesting, I don't know if you know, there's interesting research on this, that if they think of our days of the week, the Roman ones, i.e., the Celtic ones, because they were the they were Romano Celts, the upper class, are uh, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. That's Roman. Mm -hmm. And all of the others are Saxon. And there's this Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saxon. Oh, it's Saturday. Saturday, of course, is Roman as well. Uh, I'd, uh, yeah, I'd, uh, Sat Saturday is Roman. I'd say Sunday is Saxon because sun is the Saxon word for the sun goddess. But Yeah, but could that just be a translation of the... Because it's Domingo. It's, it's uh, um, I think in, in... I think I'm right saying that in Latin it is Sunday. Mm. So let's assume that's the case. And there was this research which found that the... When you get cultural change, the uh, cultural shift, the day that is the least resistant to change is Wednesday mm -hmm. because no one talks about Wednesday very much. It's boring. It's middle of the week. So Wednesday goes first, and you see that with Protestantism in, uh, the, like, uh, in Finnish, Keski Vico, that it's middle, middle of week. It shifts. And then all the others are the traditional names. You get this in a number, I think, in German as well. Mm -hmm. The German word for Wednesday is something like Mittel. Mm -hmm. No. It's Ornstag in, in Scandinavia, Odin's Day. Ornstag. Yeah. Wednesday. Yeah. yeah. But Scandinavia hasn't shifted. But in Germany, I think it's shifted, isn't it? In Germany, the word for Wednesday is something like middle day. Okay. In German. Ah. Um, and in Finnish, it's shifted in the same way. Mm -hmm. Middle day. But all the others is preserved. And so that, for me, just that tells me that there was a cultural shift. We started with Wednesday, but not getting quite to the removal of the weekend days. No. Uh, that, that was Saxoning, Saxonizing the whole country. Yeah. Yeah, that, that and there's uh, loads of plenty of other evidence that, that I because I saw those when those documentaries came out there was no DNA evidence that I could reliably look to but now the DNA evidence has come out especially in 2022 there was earlier studies in 2016 but the, the Schiffels and colleagues in 2016 did a small study of like uh, which showed the same thing it showed the Anglo-Saxon invasion happened but because it was a small sample size people were like we can't take that we can't take that as as the last word but this new it's hundreds of samples in the latest one, and you can't possibly argue anything. And so the, the traditional history, which was there was an Anglo-Saxon invasion and basically the dis complete displacement of the English Celts, whatever you want to call them. Only only displacement, complete displacement in the very eastern part of the country, and then a following integration. Yeah, so a complete displacement in the east, and then and then in the in the west, this, this uh, what would you call it, Klein, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, Celto, Saxo, Celto. Well, because gradually through the Anglo-Saxon period, they pushed further and further west to the until the you know the end of the like they start like evicting Celts from Exeter. It's in the is when they start saying they lived for a couple of hundred years, Celts and Anglo-Saxon in Exeter happily, and then one day they decided all Celts have to leave Exeter, and they banished them. So it's a but what they meant by Celt at that stage is not necessarily what we would we mean when we're looking at the genetics. Because I think by that stage, a lot of... We have also evidence from that same study, for example, of 100% British Celtic DNA people buried in an Anglo-Saxon pagan context. Mm. So that, may, that means some of these savvy upper... Maybe upper-class Britons are like, these are the new masters, so hail Woden, uh, and put me in a barrow, please, when I die. So they don't want to be Christian Romans. Oh, uh, of course, of course. They're, they're, yeah, you, they're, you get this press everywhere. I, mean, I, know, I know about it among the mm -hmm. Sami. Mm -hmm. So that, not now, or is the opposite now. But in the old days, it would be, uh, what can you call it? The, to the extent there's a classism among the Sami, i.e. richer, people with more reindeer, basically. Mm -hmm. the, the wealthier Sami mm -hmm. were the ones that were far more likely to Finnicize or Norwegianize. Mm -hmm. And then in doing so, be, as it were, more Norwegian than the Norwegians. In that way, they do. The people, on, people on Gibraltar, um, mm. or, or the, the the Ulster Scots, are more British than the British. You know, in that kind of way, they do. Yeah, and they're and they're, and they're, they're to overcompensate, and and they're kind of like that. So, like that was so that's true among the Sami. I can see how that something. Would I think it's a human trait. And yeah. we know also it happened earlier in Britain with the Romans, where there were certain tribes in 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 Britain that were very 
willing to become Roman and certain others like the Brigantes that weren't and were more resistant. Often so they could fight each other, so they would help mm. them to fight other tribes that they hated. Yes, and that's the strategy we used as well in, in our global endeavours uh, in the British Empire to set the tribes against each other. And, uh, and, in, the, and in the United States mm -hmm. as well. I mean, people forget the extent to which... Um, the native, we were on we British were on the side of the Native Americans. Yeah, we allied, We gave them guns. Mm. I mean, we allied with them mm. against our enemies, mm. um, the Americans, the um, the Yeoman Republic. So it's a, and were, were there any other developments like this, or these these are the main ones you've been talking about? Uh, I think there's so many because pretty much any area of history, but those are the most controversial ones. They're the ones that interest me because I love it. I love to. I love it when let liberal academics get upset by findings. It's just quite delightful. But uh, because they, for so long they've been able to set, like, throw shade on things, so we don't know that this is just nineteenth-century hyperbole and uh, speculation. Well, now we do know it, and the nineteenth-century academics that have been so derided for so long are actually turning out to be quite right about a lot of things. Uh, which a is, lot of things. Yeah. I mean, when I was at university, religious studies, and the group, mod the models of religiosity that were presented by people like E. B. Tyler and Sir James Fraser, that there's you move from animism to to the, the worship of spirits, to the worship of multiple gods, to the worship of one god, like that. Um, apparently, and now we're increasingly realizing, no, it's not. No, this is actually correct. This is an accurate assessment of exactly what tends to happen. And you tend to get these as societies become more complex. The nature of gods change mm -hmm. from being these gods that are just interested in your tribe or whatever to being these. Certainly, even if there's more than one of them, these moral gods, mm. and it's the, the the moral gods are needed to hold together a society of strangers. Mm. For that it's society, everyone's the same. You worship the god of your tribe. The society of strangers, you've got to have a god concerned with morality because that mm. shows you you can trust the other person and you can create cities breed big gods. Yeah, and this was dismissed out of hand twenty years ago. It was all just Victorian nonsense. A lot of it was uh, was correct. Speaking of, uh, sorry, you guys listen. Um, no, I, 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 I think that I have mixed feelings on that I, because I think it's true that naturally as you go from a primitive hunter-gatherer animist, like you, you can't, you, you can, you need to develop to the stage where you have like a polytheistic society of the sort of the Romans uh, achieved. But I don't think that monotheism is an inevitable development of polytheism. Oh, I don't mean monotheism. I mean, I, uh. well, that is true. They did say that to some extent, but I, I mean the, the, the moral God. The, yeah, that, that part I agree with. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I don't necessarily monotheism. Uh, but I suppose, well, I suppose monotheism in the sense that often these monotheistic gods are concerned with morality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Speaking of the well, Victorian era, I was in a town the other day called Colchester. Well, yesterday, in fact. Uh, it's in the, uh, the Cotswolds, is it? Uh, Colchester in Essex. Oh, Essex. You know, the oldest, oh, no, sorry. Yes, I've been there. I've been there. The oldest yeah. town in England. Is it? The, the, the Roman that, yeah. settlement of Colchester, yes? All, the, all, all towns in England with the name Chester are Roman settlements. That is true, but, the, but Colchester yeah. is regarded. Colchester plants itself on, uh, on, on the way in on the, the signpost, oldest town in England. And I was going through, um, we, we didn't, I didn't go to the centre, but I was just outside and there was, a, there, it's a military town, there were roads, artillery road, whatever. Uh, Victorian brick houses and so forth, and all, all this sort of thing, Victorian. And I noticed that there was a very large population of black people in Colchester. And then I just kept seeing them. I, I thought at first, goodness me, am I in Birmingham or am I in Colchester? But no, no, I was in Colchester. And as I sat there in the Indian restaurant in which we were eating, large population of black people. And then I realized why, Tom. I realized why, obviously, what had happened. What had happened? Which is that in 44 BC, <laughs> when England was invaded, a population of black people had come there and had settled earlier than did the Saxons. Um, and they just stayed there all that time. And these were the descendants of that population of black people who were the first settlers, pre-Saxon settlers of England. Uh -huh. And I realized- You practice your Latin on I realized <laughs> what happened. They, they, I didn't show, the, well, their English wasn't that very good, so I assumed it was <laughs> Latin. And, they, and I realized what must have happened, which is because of structural racism and whatever, um, they, they kept their existence secret um, for all, all, all this time until the racism was sufficiently weakened that the BBC could declare that they had been there all along, and they had been there all along, because oh, how yes, else do you explain the presence of a large population of black people in Colchester, the oldest city in England, other than mm. what I just said? Mm. They came there in 44 BC, they've been there, but because of racism, they've sort of hid. Mm. Uh, and then more recently, they've, they've come out, and that's true, isn't it? 
Well, it, the, it, if it's true, it does undermine rather the, the statue that I passed earlier today at Waterloo of the Windrush heroes staring heroically into the middle distance with their suitcases arriving uh, in Britain. Because if they weren't uh, in any way a significant arrival of like of, of sub-Saharan Africans in this country, and they were just you know one of many, many migrations for thousands of years, and they don't really... Why do they have the right to the statue? But, uh, yeah, that is true. But so what, what you're saying, though, you did do a video on this, didn't you? Yeah, I did. um, and I'm, I'm referencing, of course, if you haven't seen it, the the BBC rap. I couldn't even bear to watch the rap. I couldn't face it. Yeah. Uh, but th they'd always been there. Uh, black people have always been in Britain, um, even back unto the time of the Romans. Or oh, they they push it even further. They try and they try another thing. Another thing that this, this ties in also with the genetics thing. Like another thing I first talked about in 2017, the fact that the initial before the farmers had arrived, the first um, Western hunter gatherers, as they're called by geneticists, uh, the Mesolithic population of Western Europe, uh, the uh, analysis of phenotype shows that they're almost all blue eyes, and that's where blue eyes come from, um, from this, this race of people, um, uh, hunter-gatherers. Uh, but they also, they lack the genes associated with light skin that we have now, so it's quite likely they were darker than we are now. And I talked about that as early as 2017, but in 2018, they started, uh, people started trying to make out that they were black. Uh, and that confused, they were using the word black to deliberately confuse uh, people into thinking that they were sub-Saharan Africans or related to sub-Saharan Africans, which they had no relation to whatsoever. But in this rap, or, or it's not really a rap, but it's a song, um, where one the first claim they make is that the Mesolithic people of Britain were black, and they obviously is the song is called "Been Been Here from the Start" and frequently uses the term "we." The black the sub-Saharan African singer uh, says "we," referring to other people of his ethnic group. And so obviously when he said... Fascinating, because I thought ethnic social constructs didn't exist, but apparently they exist for this purpose. Oh, yes, it does. Uh, they even, you know, they even... Ethnicity, even skull measurements become... Uh, as macrosphonics or whatever, uh, that becomes valid again as a science when it's used to claim that a Roman skeleton is black. Uh, even, even then when the DNA analysis shows that it isn't black. They'll, that, that's happened a few times now. But yeah, this song begins with the... Western hunter gatherers, and in my video I say they weren't black, and then it goes on to the Roman era where it says Septimius Severus was black. He was not black either. He was half Punic, which is a Semitic people, and half Italian. And memes aside, the Italians are not black. Uh, then he, they make some other claims about uh, in the song about other people who are black, like um, uh, John Blanc, Blanc, the trumpeter of Henry VIII. But what's the big deal about a trumpeter anyway? And uh, yeah, I also did a follow-up video called uh, where I debunk eight of the greatest Black Britons for Black Britain Month that aren't actually black, uh, which includes several Roman skeletons, which were initially called black. One, for example, Beachy Head uh, in East, near Eastbourne in Sussex. Uh, everyone was saying that she's definitely black, and the BBC paid for a plaque to go up in uh, the village that says she's a, an African. And then they did, because based on her skull measurements, and then when they did DNA, I, I, when I was doing this thing the other day in Oxford, and I, I was with, with the calipers with shooting skulls, and I was told I was I was carrying a eugenic instrument, <laughs> and, and, I, and it caused the security to have to come along because complaints were made that I was measuring students' skulls, and security came out at the Bodleian Library and stood there and to try to intimidate me. And uh, but apparently that's legitimate. That's legitimate to use the eugenic instrument if to prove that a skeleton found at Beachy Head. Yes, is, it is legitimate. I can't wait to see that video <laughs> you described. But yeah, it was then a. A DNA analysis of the skull found that she was from Cyprus and had no African ancestry at all. Uh, and there's another one from uh, Yorkshire called Ivory Bangle Lady. She has, based on her skull, everyone calls her black, but she has her DNA has been sampled by Pontus Skoglund of the Swedish laboratory, uh, a famous geneticist, and he is soon to publish it. So we will find out. But my money is on not black. What about you? I would put a, a, a dinner on, uh, or a, a nice bottle of wine on not black. Yes, yes. I we'll have to see. I think it's going to be not black. So really, um, the, the BBC are willfully and deliberately lying to children. Yes, they are. And um, they, uh, I, I mean, ostensibly it's to empower black people. And if it's true that young black people need to 
feel a connection to the land by proof that the people that have lived here a long time ago were the same race as them, that legitimizes the blood and soil argument. You're basically saying that having ancestors in a land for a long time legitimizes your claim to that land. It's basically saying the Anglo-Saxons and whatever have more of a right to be there than you. Yeah. Well, if 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 you if they want to tell us at the same t- t- same time that our the fact that our ancestors have been here for a long time doesn't give us any special rights, then why they then wish to uh, convince young so, black people so, that they've so been here for a long time? What the BBC are doing is prom- is implicitly promoting white ethno nationalism to children. Oh, dastardly view. <laughs> I mean, what are they playing up the BBC traps? I mean, come on, this is outrageous. I mean, this is borderline Nazi, isn't it? Um, they're, they're, they're promoting, I mean, call cool hate, not hope. I mean, come on. I mean, this is terrible. I want hate, not hope. Ad- campaigning yeah, they're, outside they're, of their... They're asleep they're at the wheel. They missed this one. They yeah. missed this one. There's the cloth of it. But, I mean, th- this is this is appalling. So, um, but, but, I mean, is this... Uh, Another one they do, of course, is the promotion of women uh, in in history. I mean, I, I was had Simon uh, history to of course. Look, this Mary Seacole is another one. The, the, this idea that she was uh, the founder of nursing somehow it's nonsense. She wasn't a nurse at all. She basically ran a hotel in the Crimea. She wasn't even a nurse, mm. and yet we're told that this rewriting of history. So another thing, it's not just that you that you have to that your your claim to a land is legitimated by you being there a long time. It's also, I'm guessing, uh, legitimated by you having important people. Mm. that you were important there. Well, uh, the their definition of important is quite loose when you can include a trumpeter uh, in, in among the great black Britons. Uh, but, I mean, obviously the Windrush generation narrative isn't sufficient to uh, build up the legitimacy that they want to for the uh, black British population uh, according to their own uh, standards. They know so on some level plan. that what gives the Bengalis a legitimate right to say Bengal is ours is that they are the founding population of Bengal and they speak Bengali and it's named after them and it's theirs mm. and they've been there for a very, very long time. Mm. Now, if you're going to say, uh, if, if you're going to question that, well, the, 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 you know, if, what do we go back to? Do we say that the in the... The Dravidians are the true Indians, and these Indo. If we're going to say, if we, I mean, when did they settle? When, when it's only over the last few thousand years that parts of southern India moved into being a set. What could we say, Indo-European? Well, they still speak Dravid- Tamil's a Dravidian language, but the Dravidians also aren't native to India. For, so it's it's. I mean, the the definition of indigeneity is very politicized, and there is no working definition that's scientific uh, that could be applied across the no, board. No. Uh, you know, Maori. About eight hundred years in New Zealand, they're considered indigenous. Right, so but we've been longer. We've than been that. much longer than that, and you know uh, uh, that we have greater claim to indigenous status than a, a vast majority of many that do have indigenous status. They're talking about it. There was a recent article. Was it a year ago? I don't know. On the was it the BBC website or the Garden? I forget which. Saying that the Sami oh, yes. were the only indigenous people of Europe. Yeah. Now, what makes them indigenous is that some of them dress in funny clothes yes. um, and, and that, 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 that some of them are still herders rather than proper farmers and they have this kind of romantic thing that you can idealise that they use in the Finnish tourist industry and so forth. I mean, that's basically what It's copying America. Because they're white. America. They're white. They're genetically white. They weren't once, but that, that they've, they've mixed a lot. They've mixed a lot. Mm. And, and they're, they're, well, the Finns are on average about 5-10% to 10% Asian mm. and the, the Sami, it's something, it's something something like that. But there are Finns, Finnish people, that have lived in parts of what is called Sami land um, longer than the Sami. Yes. So there's this... Uh, the, but yet well, now in that... Finland, they're trying to question the, oh, if you're Finnish, oh, you've only been there however long, you're not really got a right to the land the Sami got there first. Well, this... Uh, this I don't know when it started, but like the importing of an American narrative of like the indigenous peoples of Scandinavia was basically like takes the exact American consciousness about Native Americans and the stolen land and imports it to Scandinavia and gives the Sami that status. It, it, it's sometime before genetics, I, it's the it 70s, 80s, I don't know. But the Professor Matthias Jakobsen at Uppsala University said, I think it was back in 2016, uh, well, now we know that the Sami aren't indigenous because the Indo-Europeans, I mean, the Indo-Europeans invaded Scandinavia before long before any Finnic or like Finno-Ugric peoples arrived in Scandinavia, so they're not indigenous. Like the 
the Nordic the Nordic people have a greater claim of indigeneity to the Scandinavian peninsula uh, and to Finland than um, yeah. than than the Sami. I sometimes when they make me angry as as a, as an Indo-European person. Um, um, I, as an Aryan, like living on your. Land. I was saying, they say one, one time I was in Finland, I was in Kokkola, and this guy said to me, he heard me speaking English. He said, "Go home. This is not your country." Um, I should have said to him, "I should have said, hang on a minute, Indo-European, <laughs> Finnic, get out of my country." <laughs> Damn Finns! But they're all. I mean, a lot of the Finns are very uh, Indo-European in blood anyway now, but because they have, they're not. Uh, Asians out are they? <laughs> you could look at. Oh, I don't think they were. Were well, they ever Asians? But they were. They're, they're, no, but they were Finno the Finno-Ugrics. Yeah, and it's 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 distinct. But I think the initial Finno-Ugric migrations into Europe were from people with far higher levels of Asian DNA than what you now see in modern Finns. But uh, yeah, yeah, ten, ten, about five to ten percent is the average, and that means, of course, you get outliers. Mm. So you get you get some people that look really. I mean, the best way I can describe it is that they they look like uh, I always forget the name. You know the the um, the, the pre dinosaur uh, thing called the Placerius in the in the Triassic era. Mm -hmm. um, they look a bit like that, sort of parallelogram shaped eyes, <laughs> and, and but they're white. Right. So 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 yeah. But the, the, even there, even there, the, the, a nationalistic culture like that has 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 swung over. I mean, going back to wokeness, I mean, um, but to, I mean, uh, we're going. To, well, the one thing we haven't talked about yet, and we, we did talk about it when you came on my channel a while ago, um, is paganism. Mm -hmm. And you, you're, I don't want to say you identify as a pagan, that sounds terrible. You're a pagan. Um, and um, what is it about us Northern Europeans, and indeed as it, is it us British, that make us so prone to this mind virus of wokeness in a way that is, it's, it's not true as you move further south, is it something to do with? Is it a cultural thing like Christian, like Protestantism, or something like that, or Christianity? Uh, is it something in our genetics? Why are we so prone to this? Because the Italians aren't as prone to this. I used to think this, and now I'm—I don't know anymore because I, I think Spain is extremely liberal, extremely almost hyper liberal now. So I don't know if it's—I uh, don't think it's probably got a huge amount to do with ancient DNA. Uh, it might have, I mean, initially it has to do with Protestantism and I mean, there's certainly like connections ideologically to the, you know, extreme forms of liberalism that we have that dominate now and the extremist ideas of the 18th century that came out of Protestantism. Like the Obviously, there's a clear connection between, you know, the extremists of the 18th century and the Protestant extremists of the 17th century like that that's clear to see so that we can see that like there's an ideological genealogy but i don't think at all it it's it has been contained in protestant europe otherwise the french revolution wouldn't have happened it's it went into catholic mm -hmm. france quickly uh and even ideas that were being discussed well, fair, parts of france were protestantized though weren't they yes but i don't think i mean a lot of these people in the late 18th century weren't even christians they were like deists and things like that there were all kinds of crazy ideas going around and uh, it was a time of ideological flux and re very revolutionary ideas, and you, what the sort of things that John Wilkes and Co were talking about here in London were the kind of things that were, you know, ha the same sort of stuff that was happening in Paris. And I don't think that the Protestant Catholic border is also that useful at times to it's explain it. Line, it, it, yeah, it, it, it's something. That, I don't, uh, I mean, um, I'm not a historian, of, I'm not a modern historian. Have you There's that? a yeah. tendency though, when you go up, when you cross that line, things like the household system, um, the, the idea that you, you know, that you that we used to have here until the 17th century, that you, you, you send out your child from your household to be brought up in another household, to be mm. a servant. And you get this throughout 16th century history, you know, uh, so-and-so was brought up by the Cromwell family. It was a pagan tradition and it's pagan, Germanic pagans used to send... Uh, when a boy reaches a certain age, he goes to live with his, um, uh, if, if he has one, his mother's brother, and then the mother brother, the mother brother will take him from like early teens onwards, or otherwise another foster father. So this, foster is, this is to reinforce, this is to help to, I suppose, to create larger policies. It was, it's partly because there was a special relationship between uh, nephews and their maternal uncle in that culture, but also they they had foster fatherage was a, a way of like securing. Strong relationships well, between you can be people. sure that your maternal uncle is actually related to you. Yeah, well, I think that mis paternity events aren't anywhere near as as common as in history as people think they are. Uh, there's been some tests, like it, even today in America, it's it's less than five percent, and that includes the ghetto. 
So like, uh, uh, if you remove the ghetto from that, the average goes down a lot. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? African American uh, culture has, is slightly different. But um, uh, yeah, so I think also part of it is just because sons become quite unruly at a certain age, and they're less, they misbehave less with a, a man other than their biological father. Mm, yes, that's true. That's true. But but you you do have if you go to Finland, it, it for example, it, it maintained a kinship culture for much longer, uh, and you not a, not a not a household culture. And you, you see this even in the kind of words they have. Like they have so many words for different degrees of relatedness, whereas we don't. We we just say things like brother-in-law, sister-in-law. They have separate words for each of these things, which implies that kin kinship is more important. Mm. Um, which, which in, in it's a much more uh, tribal. Uh, sort of culture than ours. Just I don't know if this, how this relates to taking on certain ideas, uh, ideas about uh, favouring those that are not kin mm. um, and outsiders. And I wonder if it just. Well, I definitely think that England is uniquely one of the well, well, quite unique in its willingness to for a, as a culture we developed a culture which was willing to take on well, like it, to take people on their merits and open to outsiders providing that they demonstrated their merit and that we have this value of meritocracy which is obviously ancient the athenians claim to have it but i think what england england got closer to it than it ever before i don't think a real meritocracy 100 percent can ever exist because we have affiliations we have responsibilities to our family members uh but um the i think we we have we became or have been at one stage the least likely to favor our own kin over uh, someone who's just better for the job, mm. uh, but uh, that has also been used against us quite a lot. No. That that's something that under sort of harsh group selection can be beneficial, isn't it? If you you have the, as long as your level of uh, kin orientation or whatever you want, or ethnocentrism mm. uh, doesn't drop too low, mm. then in in a, in a system of fighting other groups, the best thing you could possibly have is the best people for the job, so that the most brilliant people are leading you, and everyone's in their in their place doing what they're most capable of doing. Mm. Um, and if you compare, I mean, if we go back to, to, to before the old corruption in the UK, so you go back to the 18th century and or even the early 19th century, and off military officers are not appointed on merit. Well, some of them are, but a lot of them are you just buy a commission because your family is rich. Mm. And there's many, many cases of at the evacuation of Afghanistan, wasn't that an example of this? Of just some incompetent officer who's purchased his commission because of some semi-religious assumption that if you're, you're part of the upper class, then you must know what you're doing. Um, and, and they just do stupid things. And then we move away from that towards a meritocracy where we have the best people that get the... We had elements of that, of course. I mean, someone like Thomas Cromwell was able to rise from being a Putney blacksmith's son just near here, Putney, um, to being uh, to being a uh, running country, mm. um, but, uh, but so, so I guess there's that. But the the downside is if it drops too low, mm. if you're just okay, yeah, we'll have you, we'll have you as uh, we don't care where you're from, come and be our prime minister. Mm. Um, well, there there have been I can't, there was a um, a a Dutch study by a a, a, a scientist. I'm sure, I think you're aware of him, uh, uh, Abdul something, but he. Found they looked at the British class system, the genetics of the British class system, and found that it has always been somewhat permeable. So, and also that there is a eugenic uh, impact on. They didn't use the term eugenic, obviously, but there's some kind of eugenic influence on the way that that class system has been permeable. So that extremely skilled, uh, intellectually gifted people from the lower classes inevitably do rise up, and extremely incompetent people from the upper class inevitably go so down. Do that. Uh, so it's not it's not a hundred percent permeable but it's semi-permeable so that there has been and that permeability has had a eugenic effect because it means good genes going up bad genes going down so um and it also happens at a regional level uh according to those studies yes yeah, abdul i was there is yes I, I know i'm familiar with hugh jones and abdul he was the person that got stroppy about emil kierkegaard and said he wouldn't do a speech as a keynote speaker at isa if emil kierkegaard was there and that's him city person uh, well, although quite good at research, um, but yes, I, I I recall. So you have to have that balance struck correctly, I suppose, because if you don't, then you get to a point where I guess we kind of have now. Whereas if you imagine there's something going wrong in a postal sorting office among our grandparents' generation, there'd probably be somebody there working in a postal sorting office who was working class but quite clever, never had any opportunities. Maybe he was capable of being a teacher or something like that, and he solves the problem. Mm. Whereas now that person is a teacher. 
and the problem happens in the postal sorting office and there's nobody there to solve the problem. No one's intelligent enough to solve the problem. And so the problem just gets worse and gets out of hand and Luton Airport catches fire well, or whatever. Down here I heard there's been a two week delay in post here in this part of London for my family member here. I, I wouldn't be at all surprised. So, I wouldn't yeah. be at all surprised um, that, that something like that could happen because it's the, it's a very low status, poorly paid job with terrible hours and it's horrible. And so who the hell wants to do it? And if your if the education system allows you to be smart enough to get out of it, then you um, then you you get out of it. So um, rounding up, what are you working on at the moment? Um, I've got a few videos coming out about my travels in Greece. I was recently in Athens uh, last week, and uh, I was robbed there. Oh, so, how yeah. has that transpired? Well, I was actually not robbed. I misusing the word there. I was pickpocketed. Uh, so yeah, it was my own. Um, I was distracted talking to a camera in a YouTuber fashion. And uh, I must have stuck out like a sore thumb as a prime target for these savvy pickpockets. I've never been pickpocketed anywhere in the world before, and I've travelled most most places. So, oh, I thought you you were just going to use that as a metaphor for you know you were overcharged because if you're in Athens, then it, the likelihood is that whatever you're paying, you are being ripped off. Well, it's not as bad as other places in Europe. I think Athens is quite affordable compared to some places, including London. I went to Albania mm -hmm. on holiday this year to uh, Sorende in southern Albania. And while I was there, I went, for example, to a place called uh, fin uh, um, Finique, Finique, which means Phoenicia. And it's a, there's Greek-speaking villages, places that are totally Greek-speaking in Albania. This was one of them. So you've got these wonderful Greek ruins. Finique was one, Buturint was another one, where Byron went uh, to this. And you, you don't even, you, you pay an, you know, between nothing and hardly anything to walk around these ruins. Uh, you, you can see Greek writing on it, theatres. Uh, it's amazingly preserved. Um, and they know proper tourists, but they haven't understood how, to, understood how to make money yet and exploit it. They don't care. They're very laid back. Mm. So you just go to these ruins. It's amazing in this place, but rent. And you're there, it is all this Greek writing. I was able to go, here's the theatre. Here's all this Greek writing. I was able to read some of it. Or did written on the and, and here's the temple here's, uh, the city was existent along the across a thousand years Albania go to Albania that's where Pyrrhus the Great was from Pyrrhus was Albanian well he's from Albania and you've got Greek history and Greek everything but without the rip off without any of that I, I should check out Albania sometime yeah, yeah it's, just, it's worth having a look at it's worth having a look at yeah. very interesting language as well it's very unusual it's an isolate in the end in the European language family and they've been, that's another thing that they've been studying recently, the genetics of the Albanians and the Balkan people is quite interesting. Yeah, they, the, the language that it's most closely related to is Greek, but it's yeah. very distantly related. Very to distant, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they sort of moved in, but there's still these Greek-speaking areas. It's very, it's very interesting. Well, thanks a lot for coming on. It's been, it's been jolly interesting and joining to meet you at last and to, I, I hope, I think we've, I hope we've enlightened you a bit about the fact, well, at the very least, if you've learned nothing at all, you've learned that the British people really are Anglo-Saxons, uh, most of them. And we're not black. Uh, <laughs> not so much, not so much, no. Uh, and uh, I will see you all soon, and goodbye. Are you ready for the future of the West?